It used to be that people thought that Buddhism was very pessimistic. They talked all about suffering, suffering, suffering. And nowadays people are beginning to realize that, no, the Buddha was actually talking about happiness. He talked about suffering because he wanted us to understand that there is suffering in life, but it is also possible to find happiness. In fact, the teachings are all aimed at happiness. But still, many times the interpretation of this is quite pessimistic. In other words, teaching that things change, that you simply have to accept the fact that things are impermanent, things are inconstant, things are going to be changing all the time. As you learn how to accept that and be at ease with that, then you'll be happy. That's pretty miserable. It gives the impression that there's really nothing we can do, that there is no long-term happiness in life. There's no deeper happiness, there's no special happiness in life. That all we can do is just be very passive and just be okay with whatever comes up, which is very pessimistic. The Buddha actually taught something much higher and much of much greater value, which is that there is a happiness that we can attain through our efforts. Something that's special, something that's not dependent on conditions. And something that lies beyond just normal pleasures coming and going, but that lies deeper in the heart. Um, the idea that we simply have to accept that things come and go, I think comes from taking the Buddha's two teachings, what you might call the Buddha's two wisdom teachings, which are the three characteristics and the Four Noble Truths, and putting the three characteristics first, and putting the Four Noble Truths after that. In other words, saying that, okay, that the Buddha says things are inconstant or impermanent, things are stressful, things are not self. In fact, sometimes this is defined as what right view is. Um, when you accept these facts, and, the, and based on this interpretation, there are several conclusions that people come to. One is t interpreting the teaching on not-self as a no-self teaching, which is that there really is no self there, there's no agent here, you're simply on the receiving end of things coming in depending on conditions. And you have no agency in changing things. That's one, one of the conclusions that's drawn. The second conclusion is that suffering comes from not being okay with change thinking that you have the power to change things and you're going to suffer. If you think, okay, change is going to happen, just learn how to accept change and it'll be okay. That's the idea of what people are not suffering. Based on this is the idea of the clinging. That clinging means you don't realize that things are impermanent and so you hold on to them hoping that they will be permanent. But you're okay with the fact, if you are okay with the fact that things are going to change, then you're not really clinging, you're just kind of embracing lightly and then letting go. But if you ever notice the way people cling, they don't cling always with the idea that things are permanent. I mean, two of the big things we cling to in life are food and sex, right? <laughs> Does anyone think food is permanent? <laughs> no. Does anyone think sex is permanent? No. We all know that these things are impermanent, and yet we cling anyhow. And the reason we cling is not so much that we think that they're permanent, but we think that the effort that goes into clinging is worth it. The Buddha says we cling because of the pleasure we get out of things, and we think that the pleasure we gain from holding on is worth the effort that goes into the clinging. And human beings are really bad at calculating what's worth the effort and what's not worth the effort. I live in America, and when I go out to the, into the forest, I go to the north rim of the Grand Canyon, and I have to drive through Las Vegas. Now, Las Vegas is, a, is an excellent example of people not knowing what's worth it. <laughs> In fact, they have signs on the road. Someone once said what he liked about Las Vegas was that it's very honest. The signs say, 93% payback rate. <laughs> you know what they're telling you, right? You give them one dollar, they'll give you 93 cents back. And still, every Friday night, people go, go, go to Las Vegas. Every Saturday, Sunday, the, the traffic jam coming back from Las Vegas is incredible. We're very bad judges of what's worth effort in our lives. There was once a 
positive psychologist, you know, the kind of psychologist who studies why people or how people can be happy or what they do to be happy. And he began to notice that you ask people, what makes you happy in life? And they'll give a list of things. And then if you actually interview them while they're experiencing those things, they say, are you happy? And say, well, I'm not so happy. And yet people will still say, this is what makes me happy. And you can think about the meal you're going to have after this talk tonight. I mean, Singapore is a food haven, you know, you can have the whole world available to you. And so you can sit here thinking for the entire hour, well, I'd like to think about maybe some pizza or maybe some Szechuan food or whatever. And you can enjoy thinking about these things for a whole, you know, for the entire hour, miss the Dharma talk entirely. And then when you go out, the eating is pretty short, right? It's very quick, 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 and then, and then you go. Not much pleasure. And so this psychologist was saying, why is it that people are such bad judges of what makes them happy? And then he thought about himself. He liked to climb mountains. Now, if there's anything that's stupid, it's climbing mountains. You get to the top, and then you have to go down. <laughs> and there's a lot of effort that goes into going to the top and effort that goes into coming down. And he says, while he was doing it, he realized that he was actually pretty miserable. But he came back and he couldn't wait till the next time he would go climbing the mountain. So our clinging comes from bad judgment, basically. We think that something is going to be worth the effort, and yet it's not really worth the effort. And so what the Buddha is teaching us is basically to look at why we're clinging to things. It's not because we think that they're going to be permanent, but we think that the effort that goes into them is going to be worth it. And so the whole purpose of his teachings is not to just tell us to accept things as they are, but he says that the teaching is to figure out how to change our powers of judgment so that we become better judges of what's worth the effort. And this is what comes from, instead of putting the three characteristics first, we put the Four Noble Truths first. The Four Noble Truths basically are based on the realization that, yes, we are active in our approach to life. We don't just sit and receive things coming in. We are more active. And as the Buddha said, all dhammas are based on desire. Everything we experience in life is based on desire of one kind or another. Our sense of who we are, our sense of the world around us is based on our desires. I'll give you an example. My older brother is an alcoholic. And one time he came to visit me at the monastery and as we were driving from the airport into town, we went past the one place in town that sells liquor. Now, I had never noticed this place because I was not interested. As soon as we drive past, my brother says, Jeff, can I borrow the car tomorrow? I said, no. <laughs> I've been his brother long enough. I know what he's thinking. <laughs> but his world was different from mine. And as they say, if an alcoholic goes into a house, they know very quickly where the alcohol is kept. If a monk goes into a house, they know very quickly where the dark chocolate is kept. <laughs> our, our sense of the world is dependent on our desires. Our sense of who we are is also dependent on our desires. And what the Buddha is telling us with the Four Noble Truths is you have to look at your desires. Are they leading to happiness or are they leading to suffering? Now we all know that the Buddha says suffering is based on craving. He has craving for sensuality craving for becoming, craving for not becoming. Well, sensuality is what I talked about just now, is thinking about sensual pleasures, our fascination with planning, our next meal, our next trip, our next whatever the sensual pleasure is going to be. The problem is not the pleasure itself, the problem is our fascination with thinking about it. Again, you can think about tonight's meal for the whole hour, and make different changes to what you're going to do, where you're going to eat it. The, the meal itself is not so much the problem, it's the amount of, amount of time that's put into thinking about it. As for craving for becoming, the word becoming basically means your sense of who you are in a particular world of experience. That's going to be based on a desire. And again, if you have a desire for a pizza, who you are is, one, the person who will enjoy the pizza, and two, the person who has the ability to get the pizza. In other words, you as the consumer and you as the provider. That's your sense of who you are. 
and then the world around you is what is going to be helpful in getting the pizza and what's going to be getting in the way. And anything that's not related to pizza is totally irrelevant in that world. Once you've had the pizza, then the next, what's the next desire? Okay, you have other desires and there'll be a different you and a different world. Now sometimes you have conflicting desires at the same time, which is why we think we have conflict inside. And also have conflict in the world outside. But basically, this is what the Buddha means by the word, word becoming. And it's your sense of who you want to be and the world you want to have. That's, that's a kind of craving that will lead to suffering. Then there's a craving for no becoming. You get into a particular sense of who you are and you don't like it. You want to abolish it. In this way, and then that's craving for not becoming. Now the Buddha says we suffer because of these different kinds of craving. But not all craving is bad. You see, the craving to gain awakening is actually part of the path. The craving to get rid of unskillful thoughts in your mind, the craving to develop skillful thoughts in your mind, this is all part of right effort, which is part of the path. So what the Buddha is doing is, with the Four Noble Truths is teaching us to look at our desires, realizing our desires are going to shape our sense of who we are, the world that we live in, and they can go in two very different directions either leading to happiness or leading to suffering. Now when the Buddha explained this part of the Four Noble Truths, he came down with again, the desire, the crave, the three kinds of craving, those are the cause, the suffering that comes from them is a result. On the other side, the desire that's part of right effort leads to the end of suffering, and the end of suffering is the result. So you've got Four Noble Truths. Now, out of those four noble truths, each one has a duty. The duty with regard to suffering is to comprehend it. In other words, to understand it, to understand it so thoroughly that you finally don't feel any passion for it anymore. We don't think that we're passionate for suffering, but you look how people suffer again and again and again. They keep going back to things that make themselves suffer. There's a passion there. When the Buddha talks about craving he, he, and clinging, he's basically talking about our addiction to things that we've suffered from before, but we keep going back. So, and so that's the duty there is to comprehend that, the fact that there really is suffering in that clinging, the things that we hold on to. The duty with regard to the cause is to abandon it. We see the craving arise, we should see it as something we should get rid of. These are activities that we have to do. Now our problem with these two causes is these two noble truths is we usually get backwards. We think that suffering is our enemy, craving is our friend. And as a John Sawat used to say, no, it's, you've got it backwards. You have to see craving as your enemy and suffering as your friend. A friend in the sense that you want to get to know it well, to understand it. And then when you understand it, then, it, then you can go beyond it. But for most of us, we see suffering and we want to try to get rid of the suffering right away. That's the wrong duty. It's like going into your house, seeing your house is full of smoke, and you put out the smoke. If you don't look for the fire, you can just keep putting out the smoke, putting out the smoke. It's never going to end the smoke. The smoke is going to keep on coming. You have to find the fire. That's what you let go of. You let go of the craving. On the other side, you have the end of suffering. And the duty there is to realize that. You do that by developing the path. It's something you actually have to bring into being. So these are the four duties we have with regard to the Four Noble Truths. And when the Buddha taught the three characteristics, one, he didn't call them three characteristics, he called them perceptions. Ways of looking at things. And the purpose of looking at things in these ways is to help with these duties for the Four Noble Truths. In other words, you see that there's suffering. You want to see that this is, the suffering is something that's inconstant. Because it's inconstant, you want to perceive it as stressful. And when you can perceive it as stressful, you realize it's not worth holding on to as yourself. In other words, this is a value judgment. It's not worth clinging to. It's not worth holding on to. You should let go of it. Similarly with the causes of suffering. You, you see, okay, these things lead to something bad, so you have to see them as inconstant, i.e. they're undependable. 
They're stressful, something that you should not identify with. You think of your mind like a committee. And these are members of the committee you don't want to identify with. As for the path, okay, you don't apply the three character or the three perceptions quite yet. You actually try to develop the path. You apply the perceptions to things that would pull you away from the path. For instance, part of the path is virtue. And as the Buddha said, sometimes we are afraid to follow the precepts because either we feel our health will be at, at, at stake or our wealth or our relatives. And the Buddha says, you have to realize these things are impermanent. If you break the precepts and then they take you down to hell, you say, wait a minute, I did this, I broke this precept because of my mother. I broke this precept so I could make more money and give it to my mother. And what do you think the hell guardians were going to say? That's your mother's business. You've got to go to hell. <laughs> we don't care how noble your motive was. You broke the precepts. And so you say, even in cases like that, you have to say, I can't lie for the sake of my health. I can't lie for the sake of my wealth. I can't lie for the sake even of helping my relatives. You have to see these things as in constant, impermanent, stressful, things that you cannot, are not really yours. Similarly, when you're practicing concentration, you apply the three perceptions to things that would pull you out of concentration. And things that would get in the way of your discernment. So you have to be skillful in how you use these three perceptions. So in, basically, it's important that you see, could the Four Noble Truths come first? These three perceptions come within the context of the Four Noble Truths. And so instead of just simply accepting things coming and going, the Buddha is saying, look at your desires. There are desires that will actually lead to the end of suffering. And the desire for awakening is a good thing. The belief that you can do this, that, that the Buddha calls actually a kind of conceit. I, other people can do this, Tan can do this, why can't I? That's actually a skillful form of conceit. Something that you should encourage. And so what we're doing is not just simply accepting things and saying, well, it's okay, the waves are coming in off the shore, good waves are coming, bad waves are coming, it doesn't matter, I'll just sit here and accept the waves. What's going to happen, of course, is someday the waves are going to come and boom, you're gone. And who knows where they're going to wash you up again. And the image the Buddha gives of the practice is not just sitting there accepting things, it's there's a dangerous river you have to cross, but you can get across the river. And you do that by holding on to the path. And you by making an effort. You have to paddle with your hands and your feet. You have to make that effort. But there is a place of safety that you can get to. If you get up on the raft and say, look, I'm not holding on, what's going to happen? You fall off and get swept down the river. There's a teaching by a John Cha. He says, you're coming back from the market. You're carrying a banana in your hand. And someone comes up to you and says, why are you carrying the banana? He says, I'm carrying the banana because I want to eat it. He says, how about the peel? Are you going to eat the peel too? No. Then why are you carrying the peel? And then he says, what are you going to use to answer him? And his answer is, comes in two stages. He says, first you have to have desire. You have to want to give a good answer. In other words, your discernment is not going to come without the desire. You have to desire to give a good answer. And then, of course, the answer is, the time hasn't come to let go of the peel. If I let go of the peel now, the banana would become mush in my hands. And it's the same thing as we practice the path. There's something we have to hold on to. Something that we have to hold on to. If you don't hold on to the path, your mind becomes mush. So you have to hold on to the path and realize that this is a desire that's actually a skillful desire. The desire to follow the path is something you want to hold on to. As the Buddha said, wisdom comes from the question, what, when I do it, will lead to my long-term welfare and happiness? Now listen to that. What, when I do it, will lead to my long-term welfare and happiness? Okay. This is a question that he says gives direction to your desire. One recognizing there is such a thing as long-term happiness. It's not just waves coming in and going away and coming and going away. Some pleasures are longer, some pleasures are shorter. Some pleasures are harmful, some pleasures are not. 
you want to look for pleasures that are not harmful, pleasures that don't harm yourself, that don't harm other people. You want pleasures that last. And it's going to depend on your actions. That's the second part of, your, of the wisdom. It's not going to just come washing up. It depends on what you're going to do. Your actions make all the difference. That's what wisdom starts with, was that realization. And the first level of the Buddha's answer to that question, what, what I do what will lead to my long-term welfare and happiness, is making merit. Other answers also include practicing the path, developing concentration, developing discernment. But tonight I'd like to focus on making merit, because sometimes people look down on making merit. They say that it's for people who are not serious about the practice, people who are just grub grubby and selfish, they just want to make merit so they can win the lottery the next time. Does that happen in Singapore? Do you have a lottery? <laughs> At Wat Meta, we have five casinos around the monastery. We're in an area, there are lots of Indian reservations, and in America, if you have an Indian reservation, you can build a casino. Because the laws that govern Indian reservations are different laws, are different from the laws for the rest of the state. And so it's like traps for people coming into the monastery. They either trap you on the way in, in which case you may not actually make it to the monastery, or they trap you on the way out. I want to know how much merit I made at the monastery right now. You go down, you throw, so, throw some money away. Okay. okay, if that's your approach to merit, yes, it is selfish, but that's not how the Buddha was teaching merit. He's not teaching merit to win the lottery. He's teaching you merit because this is a way that you can actually develop wisdom and discernment and prepare yourself for the more advanced parts of the practice. Because on the one hand, when you look at the, what the Buddha is talking about is making merit, it's not just being generous, but it also includes following the precepts and meditating and developing thoughts of goodwill. Goodwill for all beings. You know, if you, and basically merit, as the Buddha said, is a way of finding happiness. He said, this is actually another word for happiness, is acts of merit. And you think about it, if you find your happiness by being generous, if you find your happiness by being virtuous, you find your happiness by spreading thoughts of goodwill to everybody, it's not selfish. It's actually a kind of happiness that breaks down boundaries between yourself and other people, because when you're being generous, you benefit, other people benefit too. When you're being virtuous, you benefit, other people benefit too. When you practice goodwill, you benefit, other people benefit too. So this breaks down boundaries. If you find your happiness in things like wealth, status, praise, sensual pleasures, okay, that actually creates divisions. I mean, if you gain wealth, somebody else loses. You gain status, other people lose. You go around get, trying to get praise for yourself, other people are going to be jealous. That creates divisions. So if you're looking for happiness through merit, is actually an unselfish way of uh, practicing. Now the Buddha, of course, recommends that you practice all three kinds, not just being generous, because you do just being generous or just observing the precepts, there are dangers. And John One, who was a famous teacher in Thailand many years back, once said that if you are generous but don't observe the precepts and don't meditate, you have the hope of being re reborn as a dog in an American house. <laughs> Very comfortable, people love you, but you don't know anything, you know? <laughs> right? You can listen to Dharma talks all day and not understand a word. Okay. Okay. If you are generous and observe the precepts, you have hopes of being reborn as a human being with wealth. But if you don't meditate, then you will not have the wisdom to use your wealth well wisely. And then that way your wealth can actually turn around and destroy you. As we see many times around as people who are, have all the wealth they need, but they use it in buying things that are worthless or things that are actually harmful. So if you want your merit to be safe, you develop all three kinds, generosity, virtue, and developing thoughts of goodwill for all beings. And I'd like to go into these one by one to show that they're also, in addition to being a skillful way of finding happiness, they also prepare you for the higher levels of the practice. For example, with generosity. When the Buddha taught generosity, one of the first things he pointed out was, someone once came to ask him, he said, where should a gift be given? 
Now this was a king who was asking the question, and he had asked this question of Brahmins and Jains, other religious groups in the past, and they'd gotten the, the answer. The Brahmins said, okay, a gift should be given to the Brahmins. They asked the Jains, the Jains said, gifts should be given to the Jains. And so the king was expecting, where, where should a gift be given? He was expecting the Buddha to say, give to the Buddhists. But that's not what the Buddha said. He says, give where you feel inspired. Give where you think it would be well used. There was no pressure to give to any particular person. The Buddha never said, you should give here, you should give there. After all, it is your wealth. But he's also, beyond that, he's pointing out the fact that you should, you should realize that generosity should come from a free choice on your part. He's trying to teach the basic principle of karma is that we do have freedom of choice. And one of the best ways of realizing this is when you give a gift. You are perfectly free to give to anywhere you want, anywhere you feel that you would like to give. You think back on this. When was the first time you gave a gift, not because it was expected of you, not because it was Chinese New Year's, not because it was somebody's birthday or because it was a teacher, simply because you wanted to give a gift. That means a lot more than when you're told, well, you have to give a gift here. If you go to weddings, you have to give a gift. But no, you freely wanted to give it. In my own case, I was thinking about this a while back, and I realized that when I was 10 years old, we had moved from where I lived on a farm to a little town. And in the town, I could get on my bike and I could drive to a store. Now, here in Singapore, that's a very common thing, right? The stores are everywhere. You know? But when I lived on a farm, it was very difficult to go to a store. But now I lived in a town, I could get on my bike in five minutes, I was at a store. So one day I had some money in my pocket, 10 years old, I walked into a store, and I noticed they had an egg separator. Now my mother liked to bake. She baked cookies, she baked pies, she baked cakes, and she was spending a lot of time separating the eggs. <laughs> and I thought, she would probably like an egg separator. You know those things that's just like a little cup and then there's a place where the white can go through? And it took, cost about you know, 15 cents. And so I bought my mother an egg separator and came home, gave it to her. And I realized that was, I realized thinking back on it, that was the first time I gave a gift, not because I was told to give a gift, but it was because I wanted to. Years later, after my mother died, we went through her personal effects, found the egg separator. She had made a mistake one time and put it in the dishwasher and it had melted. But she kept it. And I know why she kept it. Okay. It's when a gift is freely given, it means a lot more. And so when, this is what the Buddha is teaching is, when you really give out of the generosity of your heart, you're teaching yourself a lesson about freedom. You're not a slave to your greed, you're not a slave to your possessiveness. You have the freedom to give something away. And the Buddha wants to protect that. The, the monks are told that if someone comes to them and says, where should I give a gift? They should say, give where you feel inspired. Give where you feel it would be well used. Several years back, a student of mine had a mother who was quite wealthy, and she was going to give a gift of $2 million to a Buddhist center. And he wanted her to give it to our center. <laughs> and so he called me up and said, what should I tell my mother? And I said, Tell her to give where she feels inspired and she feels it would be well used. Okay. So, so she gave it to the other group. <laughs> <laughs> and so I thought to myself, okay, I preserve my precepts. My precepts are worth more than $2 million, okay? Felt good about it. <laughs> so, but and the Buddha has, has lots of teachings for the monks about not asking for or not even trying to influence people to give. There was a case where monks were building huts, and the monks, it was getting beyond limits. In fact, they said the people, when they started seeing monks come, they would turn away, they would close the door. Even if they saw a cow coming, they thought, this is a monk, they would turn away. <laughs> so, word gets to the Buddha, he calls the monks together, he says, look, people don't like being asked for money. People don't like fundraising. He said, even animals don't like fundraising. <laughs> told the story about there was a monk one time who was living in a forest where it was a big marsh. And the birds would come at night and settle in the trees, and they would chap, 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 all night. And he says, I'd like to get rid of the birds. And the Buddha said, okay, the first watch of the night, get up and make an announcement. Okay, every bird here in the forest, I want one feather. 
In the second watch of the night, every bird here in the forest, I want one feather. Third watch of the night, every bird here in the forest, I want a feather. And, this, and the story goes that the bird said, this monk is greedy, and they all left. <laughs> so when the Buddha wants to protect your freedom of choice in giving a gift, because you realize okay, this comes from your own choice. And you realize that you do have freedom of choice. This is the number one principle in karma. It's not that your bad karma is going to get you. The number the one principle in karma is you do have freedom of choice. What you do makes a difference. And you learn this by being generous. You also learn that you become a different person. The world around you becomes a different per world when you're being generous. This is a lesson in becoming. This is a skillful kind of becoming. You become a more generous person, your heart is wider, the world becomes a more welcoming place. So you learn an important lesson about how your actions shape who you are, how your actions shape the world around you, by being generous. Now, if you approach generosity not simply as something you want to do, but if you approach it as a skill, okay, then the Buddha gives you more instructions. It depends on your motivation, depends on your attitude, depends on the recipient, depends on the actual gift you give. These are the four things you want to think about as you make generosity into a skill. In terms of your motivation, the Buddha said the lowest motivation is, if I give this gift, I'm going to get it back with interest. <laughs> okay. okay, It's a good motivation. It's the, it's the lowest. <laughs> but it still counts as a good motivation. It's better than not being generous at all. Okay. Okay, the higher generation motivation is, it's good to give. A higher motivation is, it's not right that here I have all this wealth and these other people are poor, they don't have anything, and if I don't give, it's not right. That's a higher motivation. A higher motivation still is that giving makes the mind serene. And then finally it becomes just a natural expression of the mind, that you have something, you, all you can think of is you, how can you share it? Okay. Your motivation grows higher, and the results that come from your generation, generosity also grow higher. In terms of your attitude, you want to give with an attitude of respect. You want to give attentively, pay attention as you're doing it. You want to give with a mind of sympathy for the person who's receiving it. You want to be glad when you think about doing the gift, glad why you're giving the gift, glad when you have given the gift. These are, if you develop these attitudes, then the merit that comes from the gift grows higher and higher. The Buddha tells, there was a story in the canon about this very wealthy man who could not use his wealth. He had fine food, but if he ate the good food, he would throw up, so he had to eat very poor food. If he ride in his nice chariot, he would get sick, he had to walk. If he lived in his home, insects would attack, he couldn't live in his fine home, he had to live in a little shack. And finally he ended up dying and then all of his wealth was given to the king. And the Buddha said, in a previous lifetime, he gave a gift to a private Buddha. But then after he gave that gift, he said, gee, I wish I didn't do that, hadn't done that. I could have given it to some, you know, kept it myself. Okay. Okay, the gift meant that he was going to become wealthy, but the fact that he regretted the gift meant that he could not enjoy his wealth. So when you give, try to be happy while you're doing it, before you do it, after you do it. And that way you get the most benefit out of the gift. As for the gift itself, you want to give something that's timely, that people can actually use. Like here in Singapore, you know, in America, they like to give knitted caps to the monks because it's cold. In Singapore, I don't think you need knitted caps. <laughs> It's not timely in Singapore. And also give a gift that doesn't harm yourself or harm other people. In other words, you don't break the precepts. You don't steal something to give, or you don't cheat in order to give. You give because something that you have earned in a fair way. And then, of course, with the recipient, you try to find a recipient who would make good use of the gift. The Buddha recommends someone who is either without greed, aversion, and delusion, or someone who is working on the path to get rid of greed, aversion, and delusion. You look for people like this, it's more likely that you actually will be happy when you've given the gift. If you give it to somebody who's greedy, then you realize that they abused it, then you don't feel so glad afterwards. So look for it who you think is an appropriate recipient. Now again, the Buddha doesn't say you have to do this, 
But he says, if you want to be more skillful in giving, you think about your motivation, you think about your attitude, you think about the appropriate gift, you think about the appropriate recipient. Now, as you approach gift giving in this way, and, it, and the gift doesn't have to be a material thing. You can give your wisdom, you can give your knowledge, you can give your energy, you can give your time, you can give your forgiveness. This is often the hardest in the bunch, but it's also the most meaningful. So, in other words, when you give a gift, it's not a ritual. You don't do it just because everybody says you're doing it, but you give, you try to approach it as a skill in terms of these four, in these four qualities. Okay, the gift gives that much more happiness and it has that much more of a positive effect on the world around you and also on the person that you become. That's generosity. Similarly with virtue. You follow the precepts, you become a better person, the world around you becomes a better world. You're learning an important lesson in becoming, your important le lesson in how to channel your desires. Um, now some people complain about the precepts. On the one hand, they say they're hard and fast rules. But that they're, it's better to describe them as clear-cut. Because you need something very clear-cut when you are most tempted to break the precepts. Because if the precepts are complex and have lots of ins and outs, it's very easy to wiggle through. But if you know, no killing, no stealing, no illicit sex, no drinking, no lying at all, then when you feel tempted, you realize, oh, okay, there's a precept against this. There's a, in Alaska, they have bears. I was visiting there several years back, and they had big signs that say, bear awareness. <laughs> B-E-A-R. And there are all these do's and don'ts. You see a bear, don't run. Now that's your first impulse. You see a bear, you want to run. They say, don't run. They keep it short. Stay where you are. Raise your arms so you look bigger. The bears have very, very bad eyesight. So you look big when you raise your arms. And then they say, speak to the bear in a calm and reassuring voice. <laughs> In other words, don't scream, okay? <laughs> and they go down this long list of do's and don'ts, do's and don'ts, but it's very short, short very clear, clear cut. Finally, though, they get to it, that if, okay, if the bear attacks you, lie down, play dead. Then the difficult one, if the bear starts chewing on you, <laughs> try to figure out, is the bear chewing on you out of curiosity, or is it chewing on you out of hunger? Okay. <laughs> This is where the do's and don'ts end, okay? <laughs> if the bear is chewing on you out of curiosity, it'll stop because it thinks you're dead and it'll go away. If the bear is chewing on you out of hunger, attack the bear. <laughs> Which means you need a lot of mindfulness and a lot of alertness. <laughs> That's when we get into meditation. That's tomorrow night's talk. Okay. 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 But the precepts are very clear-cut for a good reason, because you need something that's clear-cut when you feel most tempted, break them. You feel tempted to lie, no lies. You feel tempted to have illicit sex, no illicit sex, period. That way you can hold to the precepts. Some people often complain about the precepts that they're too narrow. There's a precept against killing, but there's no precepts against eating meat. Okay? And people say, well, if you're, if you're eating meat, then you're encouraging other people to kill, kill the animals. And the precepts focus on the area of life where you, you are in charge, where you can make a difference. And that means what you do and what you tell other people to do. You can control that. Now beyond that, you cannot control. And too often we focus on things that are beyond our control, and we forget to look at what we can control. So the precepts are there to focus on what you can control. Now if you decide that you don't want to eat meat, perfectly fine. But the precept starts with, what you're doing and what you're telling other people to do. That's what you're responsible for. And again, that's focusing yourself back on, okay, the way I shape my, my life is shaped, is shaped by my intentions, my desires. I am responsible for those. At the same time, the precepts teach you qualities like mindfulness, alertness, ardency, which are all part of mindfulness practice. Mindfulness means you have to keep the precept in mind. You have to remember, I have this precept. Alertness is you have to be alert to what you're doing. 
My teacher had a student one time who was, wanted to observe the eight precepts. She came to the monastery. In the afternoon, she walked past a guava tree, and the guavas looked really nice and ripe. And before she knew it, <laughs> my teacher was standing just a few yards away. He said, wait a minute, what's that in your mouth? And she realized, oops, I wasn't paying attention. Okay, that's a lack of alertness. So the precepts require that you be alert, what you're doing right now. And the ardency is something you have to make the effort. Because sometimes there's a really strong temptation. You, know, you say, well, I can just a little white lie and it'll be okay. No. You have, that means you have to figure out, how can I not say things that give harmful information to someone else, but how can I also not lie at the same time? This is where the precepts develop alertness and ardency, and also your discernment. So the precepts are not just rituals. They're, they actually are there to train the mind in the qualities that you need when you meditate. Finally, with the practice of goodwill, the word metta, I prefer to uh, interpret as goodwill. Some people tr translate it as loving kindness. And it's based on, there's a passage in, in the canon where, the, where it's sometimes translated that says, just as a mother would cherish her child, only child, and that way you should cherish all living beings. That's not what the Buddha said. The Buddha says, just as a mother would protect a child with her life, in the same way you should protect your attitude of goodwill. You protect your goodwill at all times. And this means you don't have to like the other person. If you're going to have goodwill for snakes, you don't want to go up and pet the snake. The snake probably wouldn't like it. <laughs> right? My teacher had a snake move into his room one time. And he decided, okay, this is a test for me. So he lived with the snake for three days. Spread lots of goodwill to the snake. But then after the third night, he said, okay, three days is enough. And so, in his meditation, he addressed, addressed his thoughts to the snake, and he said, okay, it's not that I have any ill will for you, it's just that we, we are different species, and it's very easy for spe different species to misunderstand one another. <laughs> <laughs> There's plenty of space out there in the forest, we can be happy, and so please find some other place to go. And so the snake left. Now that was goodwill. It's not loving kindness, you, know, you don't go up and pet the snake. But it's goodwill for the snake. You wish the snake's happiness. Okay. Now, the practice of goodwill, you have to realize, is something, one, that you have to do, and it's also related to the teaching on karma, related to what you're wishing for the other person. In other words, you're wishing goodwill for your own sake. It's not because we're one with everybody or everybody has Buddha nature. We wish goodwill because we want to make sure that our actions are going to be skillful, even in very difficult situations. So you have goodwill for people you don't like, you have goodwill for your boss. <laughs> if you're going to have a difficult day with the boss, think thoughts of goodwill first so that when you go in you don't say something harmful to the boss, okay? Or whoever the person is that you don't like. It's for your own sake that you're extending thoughts of goodwill. Secondly, it is something you have to develop. Goodwill is not innate, or if it is innate, it's just as innate as ill will. We can feel ill will just as easily as we can feel good will, sometimes easier. And so remember, you have to realize, this is something you have to work on. This is a quality I have to develop. And finally, when you're wishing good will for others, it's not just spreading thoughts of you know, cotton candy. The Buddha basically says, you're hoping that they will understand the causes of happiness and be able to act on them. In other words, you're thinking in terms of karma. If they're going to be happy, it has to be their karma. So what you're wishing for is, you know, may this person understand the causes of true happiness and be able to act on those causes. And that's a thought you can have for anybody, no matter how evil, no matter how bad they've been in the past, whether they've hurt you or hurt people you love, or you can think of any number of politicians. When I'm th speaking in America, everybody laughs at that. Um, that you might think, of the, I, don't, it, I don't really like this person, I don't like the policies, but you can wish, okay, may this person understand the causes for true happiness and be able to act on them. You can think that thought without hypocrisy. And so when you're developing goodwill in this way, you're developing insight into the principle of karma, you're developing uh, insight into your own mind, that your mind has these potentials that you have to develop. 
You have desires that go in different directions. You have to be careful about which desires you're going to follow. So when you're developing generosity, you're developing virtue, you're developing goodwill, you're learning some very important lessons about how your desires shape the world in which you live, how your desires shape you. And by acting on skillful desires, you become a better person. The world around you becomes a better world. In America, I don't know what the attitude in Singapore is, but in America, people don't like the word merit. Do you have Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts in Singapore? In America, it sounds like a Boy Scout, Boy Scout badges, brownie points, Girl Scout badges. I think maybe a better word to translate merit would be goodness. You're developing your goodness. You're developing the goodness in the world. Now, unfortunately, this is a word we don't hear much. How many times do you speak about someone's goodness? How many times do you speak about your own goodness? I tried an experiment one time. I got onto Amazon.com. I very occasionally go on, on online. And in the box for search, I typed in goodness to see what would come up. And it was all books on cakes and pies and cookies. <laughs> That's goodness in the modern world. Okay? Okay, now the Buddha is saying there's a much greater goodness. It's the goodness of your own heart, in which you develop by developing the principles of merit, by being generous, by being virtuous, by developing thoughts of goodwill. You are developing your goodness. You're, you're gaining an insight into how your desires shape your life. You're gaining skills in mindfulness, you're gaining skills in alertness, you're gaining skills in ardency, all of which are going to be useful as you go further and further in the path. So what this means is if you bring the right attitude to the practice of merit, it's not just a ritual, it's not just a selfish way of trying to get ahead. And it's not for people who are not serious, it's for everybody who is serious about the practice. You should look at your, at your virtue, you should look at your generosity, you should look at your goodwill. As the Buddha said, if a person is stingy, there's no way they're going to get into right concentration. There's no way at all they're going to get awakening. So everything begins with the practice of merit. So don't look at it, but have the right attitude as you go about it, realizing that we live in a world not where the waves are just coming and going, coming and going. We're shaping the world by our desires. And we have it within our power to make ourselves, maybe, maybe we can't affect the world outside that much, but the world that you live in, the world that you, and the person that you are, is something you can shape in, in the right direction. And when you do this, okay, this is your, this, you're becoming a wise person. You're learning how to change your actions so that you, it will lead to long-term welfare and happiness. A happiness that doesn't harm yourself, a happiness that doesn't harm anyone else. A happiness that's good for everybody. So, those are my thoughts for tonight. Two, what time do I have? Where did my watch go? What time is it? I have some time for questions. Does anyone want to raise a hand first, or do we have to wait for the written questions? Anyone with questions, uh, you wish to you can just raise a hand and ask, or you wish to write it out, uh, you do have some paper behind. Um, Question. My time has to be devoted to many seemingly unending duties to my parents. And dealing with old parents can be very frustrating sometimes. I have no time for myself. How can I overcome this dilemma? Okay, one, realize that the duties to your parents are not unending. Either you'll die first or they'll die first. <laughs> and when you separate, you want to be able to look back at your time with your parents and not have any regrets. 
So think of it as a form of generosity. Here's, some, here's a way that you can give of your time, that you can give of your energy, and give to your parents. Now, while you're being generous and while you're with your parents, okay, this is a good time to stay with your breath, try to de develop a sense of well-being inside as you're following the duty. And that way you can be practicing mindfulness at the same time that you're practicing generosity with your parents. My parents seem to be Dealing with old parents can be very frustrating. <clears throat> when you were a child, do you think you were not frustrating? <laughs> okay. Okay. Okay, remember, your parents, it's like they're going back to a childhood. And so when they're being frustrating, you say, I probably was a very frustrating child to my parents. Here's my opportunity to develop patience. Here's my opportunity to develop a lot of the perfections and put up with that. Okay. Again, when you say, I have no time for myself, even when you're with your parents, you can breathe, right? Okay, stay with your breath. Try to make the breath comfortable. This gives you a grounding so that you can be meditating at the same time that you're with your parents. Okay. Here's a question on the John Lee's meditation technique. I was going to save questions on meditation techniques for tomorrow night. Is that okay? okay? Can you give an example of using the Four Noble Truths in everyday life? I just gave you lots of examples. <laughs> okay, being virtuous. Okay, that's right, right action, right speech, right livelihood. Okay. Spreading thoughts of goodwill. Right resolve right concentration. Good. That's, the, that's the Eightfold Path in your life. Okay. Looking at the, your clingings, looking at your addictions, learning how to separate yourself from them, okay, that's following the duty with regard to the First Noble Truth. So, by developing merit, you are actually developing the Four Noble Truths in daily life. How do we re eradicate anger in this modern world that is full of anger and lay down our burden? Okay, again, it's not the only the modern world that has anger. They had it in the ancient world as well. The problem is that just we're, we're attacked by so many more people's anger. And so you have to realize, okay, their anger is their anger. You do not have to pick up their anger. Remember, their anger is their, their karma. If, if you pick it up, there's the, the simile, someone throws a hot coal at you. Okay, if you pick it up to throw it back, you burn yourself. So I'll go into more of this on Sunday night when we talk about learning how to overcome unskillful, unskillful attitudes in the mind. But we have to realize it's one, when you turn on the internet, do you have to? That should always be your first question. As John Fung used to say, before you speak, ask yourself, is this speech necessary? And the same principle applies to turning on the internet. Is this necessary? Because so much we pick up of other people's greed, aversion, and delusion comes from the fact that we're connected. We're online. And so try to reduce the amount of time you spend online to only what's absolutely necessary. So you're picking up less of other people's anger. Do I break my precept if I put roach bait in my house? Roach bait. Okay. Okay. What happens to the roaches when they eat the bait? Do they die? Okay. You break the precept. <laughs> You have to be very careful about your food, very careful about your water. If they have, they have roach hotels in America where the roaches go in but they don't die, but they can't get out. So get a roach hotel. And then you can take the roaches down to the park. Find some way of getting rid of the roaches without killing them.
Two questions about me. What made you decide to become a monk? I was suffering. <laughs> and I found someone that I thought was not suffering. It was a John Fuang. I said, I want what he has. So, when I was in school, we had, we had, we were very fortunate. We had a monk from Thailand, a monk from Japan came to teach meditation. And I realized, okay, this is a very important skill that we don't, at that time, we did not have in America. And so I went to Thailand with the idea, I want to find a meditation teacher who would teach me more. And it took me two years when I finally met with a John Fu. Um, I didn't know anything about the forest tradition. There was not, no books available. But it just happened, a friend of a friend invited me to meet him. And I said, okay, he's someone special. And as he said, it, he didn't start out special. It was because of his training that he received from his teacher. And so I said, okay, I want this training. So I stayed with him. I found that he was very wise and very kind. And so even though he was very harsh with me, I felt it was because it was for my own good. So I stuck with him. So that answers the other question is, there are so many famous monks during your time in Thailand. Why did you choose to learn from John Phu? He was the first one I met. <coughs> and someone once asked me, and they said, there are all these famous Ajans. There's a John Cha, there's a John Mahapu, a John Fun, and a John On, and a John Tate. Why didn't you go around and see the other Ajans? <coughs> there are two, two reasons why I didn't go. One, when I went to see Ajahn Phuong and I talked about visiting some other Ajans, he says, do you already have an Ajahn or not? He said, I already have an Ajahn. He said, then you don't need another one. <laughs> and then two, someone else asked me, why didn't I go? And I said, I haven't come to the end of Ajahn Phuong yet. And he happened to die before I came to the end of a John Fuan, so I stayed with him until he died. Okay. More questions? Okay. What is the Buddhist take on mental illness? As with any illness, your illness can be a combination of two factors, past karma and present karma. Now, if it's a fact of present karma, you're basically trying to change your activities. If it's past karma, some past karma is responsive to medicine and some past karma is not responsive to medicine. And so you try medicine first to see if the illness is going to be responsive to the, the medicine or whatever, whatever form of treatment. It might be psychiatric care, it might be, in some cases, meditation is good, in some cases it is not. People who are psychotic should not meditate. People who are neurotic should meditate. <laughs> you know the difference between neurosis and psychosis? Psychosis thinks two plus two is five. Neurotics think two plus two is four, but they hate them for it. <laughs> in other words, they live in reality, but they're not comfortable with reality. Psychotics are not in reality at all. They're someplace else. Psych people with psychosis should not meditate. Dealing with my mother's mental delusion is taking a toll on my well-being. It brings me a lot of stress and tension. How do I deal with the aspect of filial piety and the duties of a child? Well, it depends on what her delusions are. Um, it's a hard question to answer in the abstract. I mean, my father, as he was approaching death, was going through um, Parkinson's um, psych. Uh, um, the word dementia, Parkinson's dementia, and you know he said, you know, there's this black dog in the living room. Of course, there was no black dog in the living room, and if you told him there was no black dog in the living room, he'd get upset. But if you went in the living room, came back, it's not there now. It was okay. <laughs> so if that's the kind of delusion you're dealing with. Learn how to work with the parameters of the delusion. If the mother is very negative all the time, just think goodwill, goodwill, goodwill for your mother and do what you can. I've found, I don't want to brag, I've been told that my voice is very calming and so you can take some of my Dharma talks and put them on in the background to kind of calm them down. I met this one woman one time that she said that when her children couldn't sleep she would put my Dharma talks on. <laughs> 
I felt a lot of chagrin. <laughs> but maybe a, maybe a calming Dharma talk in the background would be helpful. How can a person develop goodwill for oneself? Note, if this person had a difficult childhood and lived with a very limited material and challenged emotional well-being. Okay, remember what goodwill is. It's wishing that you would understand the causes of happiness and be able to act on them. So, your past is really not the issue. You're, you should, and there's, there's, sometimes people have the feeling that they don't deserve happiness. In which case, you have to remember, everybody deserves to be happy. Remember that the Buddha did not teach, teach only for people who deserve to be happy. He taught everybody. He didn't teach the way out of suffering only for people who had undeserved suffering. Even people who deserve to suffer, he said, there's a way out. Of course, the word deserve here never really appears in the Buddha's teachings. Because you have to remember, we all have past bad karma. And so the Buddha had, still had compassion for all of us. So we should have learned this way. Even if I have past bad karma, I should still have compassion for myself. Just because I have a bad past doesn't mean that I have to have a bad future. Or because people made me feel that I was an undeserving child, that, doesn't, that should not affect me now. Everybody has it within the, with them to understand happiness and the causes for happiness. Because after all, it's not a selfish thing. One of the things that people would berate you as a child is that they say you're a selfish child. But the kind of happiness that comes from being virtuous, the things that mean generous, being thoughts of goodwill, there's nothing selfish about this. So you have to remind yourself, okay, I do deserve to be happy. No matter what the past is. Because if I can overcome the causes of unhappiness in my life, that means I will be more skillful in my actions and I also be able to give more to other people. So it's not a selfish thought to wish yourself happiness, wish yourself goodwill. Do you have any advice on how we can continue to follow the path? I always feel reminded much better after listening to Dharma talks, or if I read Buddhist literature, but then I get busy with work, family, etc., and stray from the path. Okay, this is when you have to realize, okay, your breath is always there. Even when you're working, even when you're with your family, okay, the breath is always there, and you can make the breath comfortable. This is an important principle in the meditation. It's not just noting what's there, it's again, being more proactive and creating a sense of well-being for the breath. Being a, creating a sense of well-being inside and learning how to carry that around with you. And if it, the problem is at work, you might put a little sign at your desk. Okay, breathe. <laughs> put signs around the house. Buddha, something that will remind you. Because it's not like, you know, the Dharma is only for when you're sitting here listening to the Dharma talk. The Buddha means for it to be taken into your life. So that you, when you work at, when you're at work, okay, it's an opportunity to observe the precepts. But the work may make it difficult, but here's a chance to develop your discernment, to develop your ingenuity in learning how to be more skillful in observing the precepts. I understand that John's stand on Bhikkhu Ni ordination. What are your suggestions for females who want to lead the holy life to its completion without ordaining? Is going forth necessary and giving the best conditions for females to practice the path? Okay, ordaining as an eight precept nun does count as ordination. And there are good communities where there are good teachers where you can ordain as an eight precept nun if that's what, if that's what your choice is. So look for the good communities. It's just like 
there are some bad, there are bad nun communities and there are some bad monk communities. You have to be careful about where you practice. I can accept many things the Buddha taught, but when it comes to heavenly beings and their stories, for example, horses in heaven, <laughs> it is hard for me to accept what so I'm going to accept. What do you think? Okay, the Buddha asked you to believe in one thing, and that's karma. Okay? As for horses in heaven, that's not related to the question of why are you suffering right now? Okay? Anything that's related to the question of why are you suffering, what can you do to put an end to suffering, again, I believe that it depends on your actions. Okay, that's something the Buddha said, do believe in that. Because the principles of karma are not anything he can prove. He cannot prove freedom, your freedom of choice. He cannot prove that your actions have results. But he says, if you assume this, you will be more likely to act skillfully. If you assume this, then you will be more likely to benefit. So that's where he asks you to believe. And this is for horses in heaven. I, f I forgot that there were horses in heaven. <laughs> so don't let the horses trip you up. Okay? Ah. Please explain dependent origination in simple language. <laughs> How many nights would you want? <laughs> Simple language. Okay. Two most important things to realize. Okay. okay. There are two kinds of causes that influence whether you're going to suffer right now. Causes that come from the past and causes that come from your present actions. And your present actions are more important. That covers a lot of dependent origination. Okay. Okay. Two. When you look at the list of dependent origination, sensory contact comes in the middle. It means, okay, as soon as you see things or hear things, a lot of things have already happened in the mind. There's a lot of fabrication, there's a lot of different activities in the mind. You're basically going out and looking. And remember, the, the principle I said earlier that things are based on desire. And Basically, it is desire that runs the show. And so you're not suffering because of things coming in, you're th suffering because of what's coming out of the mind. And if you can train yourself to be, have more knowledge about what's coming out of the mind, you'll be less likely to suffer from what's coming in. So look at your mind, and because <clears throat> all too often it's not the case that we are sitting around perfectly innocent and something beautiful comes in and we feel lust or greed or something bad comes in and we feel anger. All too often we're out looking for something beautiful to aggravate our lust. We're looking for something to get angry about. I have a student, one of my monks at the monastery, and occasionally the monks have to go down to the airport when another monk is coming back from a trip. And he began to notice that he was spending all of his time looking for the pretty women. And he noticed, okay, there was a pretty woman here, a pretty woman there. He said, what if I looked for the signs of aging? And so he went to the, went to the airport that day and said, okay, I want to see the signs of aging. Where are the wrinkles? Where is the white hair? Where are the bent over people? And he saw they were everywhere. And he hadn't noticed them before. So what you see depends on what you're looking for. So ask yourself, when you're looking, are you looking for trouble? <laughs> okay, that's dependent core rising. <laughs> okay, last question. If a person is psychotic and he can't meditate, what can he do? He can be generous. He can learn to follow the precepts. Because it's in being generous and following the precepts. And the reason people are psychotic is there are things in their personality that they feel very bad about and they just try to deny them. And so by training them in generosity, training them in virtue, it gives them more to feel good about. It's like having more good members of the committee. 
And as you get more good members in the committee than the bad members, then you can begin to admit, oh yes, there's some bad members in here. So it strengthens your self-esteem. So there's still plenty of the practice. Virtue and generosity is still, is still a lot of the practice. It's possible. Okay, it's nine o'clock. It's been a long night. Okay, thank you for your attention.